if I'm hosting. What's my witty? What's my witty line, GP? What's that? I guess I'll click on it with my pointer. Today on. <laughs> Let's not use that. That was so bad. <laughs> no, that's fantastic. We're totally using that. All right, cool. <laughs> Thanks, GP. Yeah, no problem. That's what I'm here for. <laughs> Welcome, everybody, to another episode of Press B to Cancel, the greatest podcast you'll listen to until, well, until those other guys come on. Anyway, I'm Sick Jake, your host this week, but never alone. No, no, sir. I'm joined by two wonderful people this week. First off, I'm joined by GP of the newly restarted Retro Therapy. How you doing, GP? I am relieved. I can't tell you how wonderful it is to know that the voices that you hear actually belong to real people. So I'm glad to be here. Outside of the ward. Anyway, I've said too much. When multiple recordings is the validation we need that we're not insane. I like it. Also here, but not insane, Sinistar, longtime supporter of Press B and all of our channels, and also started streaming again as well. Sinistar, thanks for coming back. I am happy to be here. And and sanity's in question, but we'll go with it for now. Well, you do have kids. This is true. <laughs> All right. Well, everybody, this week we're going to talk about something. I don't know if we discussed this genre of games before, and maybe it's a bit of a gap in our our retro libraries. So this is kind of good. This is why we want Sinistar to come on, because when GP and I were kids playing Nintendo, wasting our brain cells, Sinistar was playing the real stuff on the PC. I I think that's the case, right? Uh, I, yes, in fact, I uh, I had to go to my neighbor's house to uh, to play the uh, the NES and and whatnot. Right. So one of the great things that PC games is known for is the advent of the adventure games uh, or point and clicks. So I kind of wanted to discuss there. We all have a couple of picks that we want to talk about today about adventure games. But I got to talk about first about the genre itself and what actually what actually is an adventure game. Because as a genre, that term gets tossed around a lot, right? Like we're not talking Legend of Zelda adventures, right? We're talking more about... Is it Mist? Would you guys say is an adventure game? Yeah. Do yeah. the Sierra games count? Sierra for sure. Um, Lucas Arts had a whole swath. Um, I mean, if you want to go back even further, there were you know the text games. Everybody's probably heard of Zork. Yeah. So does that count as an adventure game? Do you guys think? Uh, I mean, it's not a point and click. But uh, you know, I mean, even the early point and clicks, like if we want to talk like King's Quest in the very early early days, um, you know, you, you essentially had a graphic interface, but you still were typing, you know, take rock or, you know, look tree, etc. Hump chair, as I used to do in King's Quest 3. Yeah. But, you know, <laughs> when you're a child and you're very bored. Yeah, you tested all out, all out, you tested out all the swear words, you know. Yeah. Well, the CR games are great, too, because I think it was the Space Quest series, I, I guess I know the most of. I played the original uh, 3 and 4 and it was a typing ones, but I think they all eventually got a re-release with updated graphics and mouse support. So kind of basically touched uh, yeah. becoming a point and click later on. Yeah. In fact, I recently uh, ran through them uh, one through three um, on stream. When I say recently, I think it was, I don't know. It was, it was mid COVID and that's a weird time. Well, yeah. I mean, just months just fly by. Yeah. Still not wearing pants. Exactly. GP, how about you? What kind of adventure games? What kind of games do you think fall in that adventure game genre to you or that you've played? To me, a lot of it is going to be action reaction kind of thing. So, as somebody who kind of grew up playing Dungeons and Dragons, things like that, where you communicate to what would be the dungeon master in this game, the game, you know, whether it's typing in with Zork or clicking on something from Maniac Mansion and then finding out what the repercussions of that are. As opposed to, I mean, I, obviously you hear the word adventure, you want to think like RPG, like you said, Zelda, or like Final Fantasy, or, or you know, Dragon Quest, any of those. But uh, no, I think it's, I'm going to go ahead, do the action, and then wait and see what the outcome is, and then, you know, react, or in my case, reset. All right, all right. So yeah, the, the, the D&D model. The D&D model, okay. Yeah. I, think, I think for me it was always... 
I guess the story, right? Combat may or may not be a factor, but there's usually some kind of light puzzles, and it's the story of the narrative that is the focus of the game. I think that, to me, is the adventure game. And I think for games like Myst, right, or, or Adventures of Monkey Island, or whatever it's called, right? I guess it's, it's point and click, but it's the story that drives the experience. Yeah, absolutely. Sure. Um, yeah, I, I, I wanted to kind of touch, you brought up, you know, RPGs, role-playing games. Um, you know, the that genre, when I was playing, you know, early computer RPGs, it was it was a very niche genre, right? I mean, there was, you knew when it was a role-playing game, uh, you know, now with things like Skyrim, you know, all of that, like, it's a lot of the lines have blurred. Right. Even, you know, the some of the shooters now, you have, you know, leveling and abilities and stuff that get added. So, you know, you see the tag role-playing game thrown around a lot, but uh, you don't, you see action, but you don't see adventure so much thrown around. It seems it seems to have kind of not bubbled into everything else. It's, it's interesting you say about the RPG kind of mechanics getting blurred into various genres because so there's a game I have I never played before when it came out, but I got Game Pass again. There's that dollar deal for three months, and I always want to try Sea of Thieves, mm. and they just got an update with Pirates of the Caribbean stuff in it. So I've never played it before, and I just played it this past week for about a dozen hours. And my first reaction to that was, I thought this was an RPG. <laughs> I thought there was like loot and stuff, like stats and stuff. And there, there's loot, but it's there's no there's no skills to upgrade in Sea of Thieves. There's no and there's nothing that unlocks really. It's all cosmetic, right? And it's not the RPG I thought it was. It's really just an adventure game, right? The gameplay is just the the mechanics, the sailing. That's that's the game. So it's kind of interesting that it's it's. I thought I assumed it was an RPG. <laughs> Right. right, without even playing the game. No, that brings up a great point because I played Sea of Thieves when it was first released, and uh, you know, thinking about it now that you've mentioned that, yeah, it probably would be closer tied to an adventure game than to an RPG. Yeah, yeah. Like even the puzzles in that game, right, where it's like mm -hmm. finding gems and statues and stuff, and and moving columns around, like it's it's very adventure like, right, right, right. All right, but that's far too modern. We, we're a retro <laughs> podcast, mostly. There you go. Yeah. Um, how about uh, Sinister? How about we start with your first pick then? What was an adventure game that you brought to the table? Uh, yeah. So I brought I brought two. Um, I'm going to probably start with um, Sam and Max Hit the Road. Um, I'll save my second because uh, it's my favorite adventure game for later. But uh, Sam and Max Hit the Road, um, one of my absolute favorites. Uh, one of the things that I absolutely loved about you know, point and click, whatever, whatever genre we're calling it, uh, was the humor that they brought to a lot of it. And, uh, right. And that kind of culminated, you know, Sierra had some humorous, you, you brought up space quest, which obviously had a lot of humor, you know, but they also had some very serious titles, you know, police quest was a very serious title, et cetera. But Lucas, oh, oh yeah. Uh, other than, other than if you, you know, forget to walk around your car, right. <laughs> I don't know if you remember that mechanic. Your car would blow up if you, you know, drove off without walking around it. But, um, and I think I'm being a little, a little, uh, extreme on that. But, uh, no, so Sam and Max was a LucasArts, uh, genre, uh, title. GP already brought up Maniac Mansion, um, which was another yes. LucasArts. Um, and so for me, LucasArts, while they had a few serious titles, they really culminated kind of that humor. Um, so the story behind, uh, or I guess the history behind Sam and Max is, uh, a gentleman by the name of Steve Purcell, who, who actually created a comic strip. I think it was called on the road or something like that. With the same characters. Yeah, it was, no? it was Sam and Max. Um, oh. they, they were freelance police. One of them is a anthropomorphic dog. And the other one as is kind of self-described as a hyperkinetic rabbity thing. <laughs> And then LucasArts actually hired Steve Purcell uh, to come in and be an animator. And, and as part of it, he brought, you know, his property, Sam and Max, in and they made a game from it. And huh. yeah, and it's just one of those, it, like the, the absurdity, um, it's all over the top. You know, some of my favorite things are it, at the very beginning, not to, you know, spoiler warning, a little bit of a spoiler warning. This happens in the first five minutes of the game. It, during the intro, they take out this mad scientist who it turns out is a robot and his head's a bomb. 
as you do. Exactly, yeah. exactly. And they get into their, you know, into their, um, you know, freelance police office. And Sam or Max says, you know, I don't know if something's going on, if, the, if they're, you know, ticks burrowing into my brain or something, but I hear a ticking. You know, Sam says, oh, yeah, we should probably dispose of that bomb. And they throw it out the window and they say, wow, I hope nobody was on that bus. And the other one says, yeah, at least anybody we know. You know, and oh, so that's... it's it's that level of humor. Right. And then the the kind of the uh, the premise of the game, you know, you get called by the commissioner um, as the freelance police. Uh, you are called to go investigate the disappearance of a Bigfoot from a, a circus. Okay. And Trixie the giraffe, uh, giraffe necked girl. And that's kind of where it starts. And I love it because it continues into their kind of, I think they have a tie to some real landmarks. Um, but you travel around the U S things like the biggest ball of yarn. There's another one called frog rock. In fact, if I remember right, Steve Purcell or one of the, one of the creators remembers as a kid going to frog rock and thinking, this doesn't really look like a frog. And so, but it's great. You travel around the, the U S it was one of the early kind of voice acting, um, titles. Well, what year did this come out actually? Uh, this came out in 93. Okay. Yeah. And everything that LucasArts did for a long time. And I, 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 I may be misquoting here. It may have been the entire, uh, run, but they built a, an engine called scum which was yes. famous. Uh, yeah. The, the scripting engine for maniac mansion basically. And they've, they just expanded it and expanded it. And um, yeah. So that's kind of the, the rundown to um, Sam and Max, the, as with any and all, and I'll talk about this a little bit with my second title, but uh, being that it's LucasArts, there are, a number of throwbacks to uh, other Lucas titles like Star Wars uh, within the game. But yeah, I, uh, I, I, I don't want to give too much away because it's well worth playing. Yeah, this is one where, I mean, I've heard of Sam Max the characters mm -hmm. for years, but I never did play, I, honestly, I didn't play a lot of these adventure games. And I feel like I really missed out on the LucasArts stuff because I was watching someone play Monkey Island, for example. And it's funny, right? right. The characters are great. So if Sam Max is close to that, I, I got to play it. So 93, is it all voice uh, acted or is there just uh, certain scenes? You know, I'm, my, uh, my, my mind palace may be a little fuzzy here, <laughs> but uh, if I remember right, I think it was only released on CD. I don't think there was a disc version. And so I think uh, as far as I've played it, it's all voice acted. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, it was the benefit of the, the CD-ROMs, right? Oh, just for sure. so much more space, and they just really fill these things with audio. Absolutely. <laughs> Which is great. Well, I was going to say, uh, you know, looking at um, the, the Internet Mind Palace, it does say it was one of the first to incorporate full voice talent. So, Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah, because if I'm not wrong, I think it was Maniac Mansion didn't have music, I think, for example, when it came out on PC. It wasn't until the NES version that got, uh, got the soundtrack. Oh, I that's interesting. That, I think so. I got to check that out. Yeah. GP, have you heard of Sam Max? Yes, but mostly it's like 15 minutes ago. Just today. <laughs> Fantastic. No, no. <laughs> and I, I got to apologize. I kind of misunderstood the assignment for the episode. Like, I'll bring some heat and, and some good points, of course, but I'm mostly here for the ride now with you and Sinistar, so consider me part of the audience that can just interact and throw in a couple of things here and there. Absolutely. All right. yeah. I'm so yeah. sorry. Well, that's the thing. So maybe you'll feel better when I give my, my pick because, like, like I said, this genre is, is, an, is a strange one, right? It's very, when you drill it down and think about it, it's a lot more expensive than we think about. When we first mentioned point and clicks, right, only, at first I wasn't thinking Sierra stuff, but I think it does, definitely applies. I wasn't thinking Telltale stuff, but I think it applies. Like, like this is a genre that's been around for decades and it's mm -hmm. really evolved over the years. And sometimes those lines get blurred, but that's interesting. Um, now I'm second guessing myself on the PC Maniac <laughs> Mansion soundtrack, so I could be wrong. So feel free to tell me I'm wrong on Twitter at Press B to Cancel. 
<laughs> if I remember right, and, and, you know, this is, you know, one of the things that my brain does incredibly well is Cole's knowledge that, you know, is old. And, right. um, so for me, you know, I think that they even did a remaster remake of Maniac Mansion. Either way, even if you play the original, it's fantastic. And then just a quick call out to the, to the follow, the follow up. Actually, I can probably talk a little bit more about that with my next game but really quick day of the tentacle another fantastic um title which was the follow-up to maniac mansion there was a there. follow-up to maniac there was mansion? no music sorry <laughs> i was right there's only music at the beginning and the end there's no music for the rest of the game it was completely silent wow. until the nes version which had that looping song <laughs> anyway, Day of the Tentacle, yes, that was a sequel to Maniac Mansion, if you want to go ahead and talk about it. that's a, I heard that was it's one I have not played yet again, <laughs> but I heard it was really good. Just to just to make sure I heard right, is it Dan and the Tentacle, such as there's a guy named Dan carrying a tentacle, or is there a tentacle named Dan? Uh, it's Day of the Tentacle. Oh, I'm sorry, I said Dan, I meant Dave, I'm so sorry, but it's neither, I was wrong on both counts. Day of the Tentacle. But you do bring up, you said, is it, is it a tentacle named, you know, it, it is a, there, there is a tentacle that is kind of the main bad guy. And, uh, by the way, if you, if, if I can call myself out a little bit here. Yeah. Uh, as you know, I'm a huge Mr. You know, fan. Right. Dave, the yes, tentacle yeah. runs fantastically on the Mr. And especially if you have the MT32 Pi stuff, because it does have that MT32 audio. And so at some point I'm going to play through that on my, on my stream. But, uh, yeah. Is it, was it a CD game or a disc game? And it was a CD game because it also is a full talkie. And that runs fine on the mister. Uh huh. Yeah. In fact, oh, uh, I really need to get into that core. Like I, I love a mister, but I have, I've only touched the surface of the PC stuff. I really need to get that DOS core up and go. we'll talk. We'll talk. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, Day of the Tentacle. Awesome. Um, great. Uh, so the the whole premise behind Day of the Tentacle uh, was they they kind of wanted to make it. What was it that you were in a one of the old cartoons? Like you were you were kind of the bumbling, you know, almost uh, Scooby Doo style. You know, going through the house trying to figure out, but also, you know, when I say Scooby Doo, it's it's kind of like everybody was was Shaggy. Of a different type. Okay. You know? Like nobody there is really constant stoned. <laughs> I, well, there is definitely one character. <laughs> is, is this a hentai? Cause I might've seen this. <laughs> that's wrong. Kind of tentacle. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So no, it's not. So no, I haven't. Okay. That's fine. Yeah. But GP, if you played maniac mansion, uh, yeah. definitely suggest day of the tentacle. Well, okay. So here's the thing. I've, I've played the opener of maniac mansion. Mm. <laughs> I, I don't want to... I, I'll have my time in the sun here in a few minutes. I want to keep listening. I'll, yeah. Well, I I'll need wait. to go replay uh, Day of the Tentacle because I, I don't remember enough to, to kind of go into that one. But uh, it is it is on my list. And as I mentioned, it runs it runs well on the Mr., especially with the MT32 uh, add-on. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. I'll have to check that out. Uh, for Sam Max, real quick to go back. Yeah. Is it is there puzzles in this one? Uh, yes, there are. There are. Um, they're not, they're not the, the most difficult of puzzles. I mean, it's, it's that adventure genre puzzle where it's, you know, there's, there's a couple puzzles where you have to combine a few items and then use them in the correct way. Uh, there, there are some, you know, spatial puzzles where you need to move from one area to the other, um, you know, stuff okay. like that. But yeah, yeah, there are a okay. few. Yeah. Cause that's what I was struggling with, with my picks was my, my one pick is, there's not much in the way of puzzles that I thought there was. I just went and watched a, a playthrough of it uh, today mm. to refresh my memory because it's been ages since I played it and there wasn't much in the way of puzzles. And I'm like, does this qualify as an adventure game? <laughs> so I was, I was second guessing myself. But yeah. I, I get to my pick after. I, I think uh, I think that any any of those, you know, I think that we remember a lot more puzzles than there really are. Because I went back through, yeah. as I said, and played, you know, Space Quest 1 through 3. And yes, while there are puzzles, they never really, you know, looking at them now as an adult and, you know, how many years later, I don't want to date myself, but uh, I remember more puzzles from, from being a kid. Well, I'm, I, Space Quest 2 is the one I played, mm. and I feel like a lot of that was not touching the wrong things. Right. right? So not really puzzles, just environmentally, like there's a there's a screen with a big, a big uh, tentacle. The maze, right? 
maze, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And it was mostly just avoid touching it. Similar to like don't climb certain trees and it was like an underwater th- or a tunnel thing underground, I think, section. And it was more spatial, more mazes, not necessarily right. like puzzles. I, I love the game, but it's not the one like, with the dripping acid that if you you know touch the acid you die. I think so, yeah. yeah. Very frustrating. <laughs> uh, absolutely. I think there's a clip of me when I played through it go you know, saying, Yes, I made it anyway. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, GB, how about your pick? How about you give us your, your, your game? Sure, I'll talk for a few minutes and then I have some questions if that's okay. No. Uh, first off, okay. <laughs> first off, <laughs> I started by kind of making the comparison to D&D, which is kind of always how I've I've imagined it, like you're mm-hmm. playing D&D with a, a an AI so to speak, you know, or a, a computron that can give you limited answers based on what you decide to type. But now as we're talking about it, maybe it's more of like do you remember the choose your own adventure books growing oh, up? I love those. Maybe it's more like that. I rebought those when they re-released them. Yeah, they were great, and I was all about those. I guess, in hindsight, I felt like I enjoyed those books. I would enjoy the point-and-click adventures, but every time I've tried the point-and-click adventures, I die immediately, and I feel like it's looking for me to do one specific thing, and I don't know... I don't speak the same syntax as this machine. Kind right. of like, and forgive me if you've ever had a significant other where you can tell there's something that they want, but you don't know to, how to ask them what they want. So I've always felt like there's a communication gap between me and those games. So maybe now as a grown up, I, I should go back and try the, the NES ones, you know, or even Myst, because Myst was ported to a couple different things, starting with, was it, they were on Super Nintendo, yes? Or was that only Myst? PC? I think it was only a PC. I'll have, um, PC, Mac? I'm sure there's different versions of it, but I think it's only those know. platforms. But I'm I'm so out of the reality of this genre that, like I said, I misunderstood the assignment. We were kind of all talking earlier this week, and I had said, like, yeah, sure, I'll take on Telltale games, which, you know, I'm thinking Batman because I love Batman, but I've never played these games. So I, I was watching YouTube videos, and I get the correlation here about how they've mixed, or not mixed, but they've cobbled together cinematics storytelling mm-hmm. which is huge in anything you know dc or I, I guess mostly just comic book related especially with lore that's so beloved but then the mechanic mechanics of when you're not brawling it becomes much more of the point and click whereas you're you're trying to figure out exactly what the game wants although you're not always sure what questions to ask and in that way i i, I get the correlation so now i understand the, the the backstory and all that the development and the new engines that were made for some of the Batman games that Telltale was was pumping out or still might be pumping out. And the story is great. Uh, but they started really kind of doing this. And this is one, not even modern, but GameCube game that I, I feel is still a point and click. And it was uh, the Batman Begins video game. So they created this game that is a lot of stealth stuff. But other than that, it really is point and click. You've got a set number of keys that you can use. And then you've got your lock picks, uh, which you can only use so many times before they break. You've got to try to figure out which ones to get into, you got to do it in a certain rhythm. And it is very much, what's the word I'm looking for? Algorithmic, where it's if this, then this. If this, try again, or go back to this place. I don't think that that's something I would have ever put together had we not, had I not misunderstood the, the assignment like I did. <laughs> but now that I did, it's, 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 it's on my radar for shit that I need to try again. Does that make sense? Oh, for yeah, sure. Yeah, no, totally. Okay. Yeah. So I again, I'm not speaking the same language you guys are, but I'm thrilled to be listening to it. And it's kind of putting that spark in me of like, you know, I, I did all those blind runs and first playthroughs before. I've started, was it Maniac Mansion or Uninvited or Shadowgate, where like you're in a car that breaks down, then you find the house and you've got to try to go through it? I'm trying to think now. Was, no, no, was that Uninvited? That was No, Uninvited was the haunted house, right? Yeah, I think maybe that's what I'm thinking of. As was Maniac Mansion, though, right? So okay, well, so either one. I mean, not 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 <laughs> so much haunted, I guess, but still, yeah. yeah. But I, I equate it yeah. to creepiness and jump scares, and then basically just hit reset. And so I never made it far. I don't think I had the again the syntax, the vocabulary to appreciate these games growing up. But yeah, maybe that's something I need to do, especially now that I'm streaming again, is to give some of these um, a, a better shot. And again, you know, having just grown up on Nintendo and Sega products, I, I can't say I know much about PC stuff, but that's absolutely stuff that is widely available to just about everybody now. 
And sure. maybe that's maybe that's something I need to to go into because may, fuck it, maybe I'll love it, you know. Well, the one thing that's great is that GOG is uh, all about the classic PC games For and sure. repackaging them so they're playable on modern on modern computers. So GOG is just a trove of point and clicks and adventure games. Absolutely. And and you brought up Telltale, right? And I I haven't played the Batman series on Telltale, but I have done a few of the other series on Telltale, um, like the Back to the Future series, which is fantastic. Um, and then there's one that I, I can't speak highly enough of, uh, which is The Wolf Among Us, which is actually based on a comic series as well. Um, you know, I, I guess I, I guess I really like, you know, games based on comic series, but, uh, uh, Wolf Among Us. Now it's, it's gritty. It's dark. Uh, it's, it's very much, it's, I, I mean, I want to say it, it would probably get a mature tag from being gritty and dark. Cool. Okay. But, uh, it's based on the, the comic series Fable. Uh, or fables, fable or fables, uh, which is kind of a retelling of, you know, the old, you know, fairy tale fables. And so the wolf among us is about, you know, kind of the wolf man. Anyway. That's like a modern take, right? Like he wears yeah. a suit and stuff from what I saw. Yes, absolutely. And, uh, and it has a handful of quick time events. So, you know, once again, we've gone away from that point and click to, you know, I mean, you do move around the game, you do, you know, look at different things to investigate, but then you do go into some scenes where it's like, you know, you have a moment to press, you know, the correct button, et cetera, or else you, you know, suffer some consequence. Right. Yeah. yeah I don't think I played that one. I played the, the, the first Walking Dead episode. And mm. I, I always meant to go back when they were finished, <laughs> but I never did. Right. But the one thing that, that struck me weird about that one is they, you, you're given choices as you play through the episodes of, of Telltale games. And I think it's the thing they do in all of them. But I didn't realize that a lot of the time, the choice you pick doesn't necessarily affect the end of the game. And it's kind of like a false choice. Hmm. Is that something that's in Wolf Among Us too? No, Wolf Among Us. So I played, um, you know, I played through the, at least I think they had a series after the one I played, if I remember right. But it definitely did affect uh, the, you know, like the next episode, um, you know, either... Some, you know, person that, or, you know, NPC is, uh, to use that term, uh, is either missing or gone or treats you differently. And so, yeah, it definitely felt, it felt like that there was a a definite effect on the game based on the choices you made. Okay, that's good. Yeah. Yeah, because that, that's like, when you think adventure games, replayability is usually not part of the genre, <laughs> right? Right, right. So to find out that there's actually like a consequence and changes in story to your decisions, that makes it a little bit better that you can go back and replay these. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Back in the day, you know, this concept of multiple endings wasn't, wasn't such a big thing. Right. Um, in fact, I think there are some games that I didn't realize had multiple endings because it wasn't a thing that did back in the day. Like correct me if I'm wrong, but doesn't like Metroid or something have different endings. I don't remember. It does. I mean, they're not. I mean, it's Nintendo, so they're not drastically different. Yeah. But uh, depending on how fast you beat the game, I think it was. Uh, well, for the Super Nintendo one especially, depending on how fast you beat it, you get a uh, a, a, a sexier sandwich, basically, right? If you beat it under X hours, she takes her helmet off. You beat it under three hours, and she's in a swimsuit. Oh wow! Uh, I want to say the Nintendo one was the same, but hmm. not, I'm not quite sure. Samus in a swimsuit. This is something I haven't tracked. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There's a whole, it, well, in the NES version, it's more of a leotard, mm. something you would see in Flashdance. Yeah. <laughs> but wait, this this begs the question. Wait, Samus is a girl? <laughs> oh, funny. Yeah. But I have, yeah, I have all those all those magazines. Wow, <laughs> my life choices are so much different now. <laughs> the original pinup girl. Now Samus is a fantastic character. I love Metroid sure. series, but that's yeah. a. Whole other Wonderful. episode. Absolutely. Right. I'm gonna write that uh, one down though, because that's a good topic. I love Sam- I love uh, Metroid. Okay, so not Samus just as a topic, but the entire series of Metroid. Uh, well, yeah, she's she's the main part of the series, though, right? Yeah, her and that dude, like the main character that you play as. But- <laughs> Funny. Yeah, Samus yeah, is know. Mother Brain, right? Yeah. Oh, <laughs> okay. I gotta, I gotta end this now. So, Samus is right. the, the Metroid. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh-huh. Anyway. Yeah. <laughs> Her last name is Craid, okay? It's Craid. <laughs> Sam is Craid. So, quick go. question real quick. With the classic NES ones, because I, I went ahead and tried to look up if there were Game Genie codes for these things. <laughs> how would you do that? Uh, are there multiple ways to skin the cat, so to speak? 
or is it just it's looking for you to do one specific thing? You're talking adventure games now, right? The, the, right. Yeah. 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 Sorry. Yeah. Okay. Generally, generally back then, um, you know, it was it was really kind of one way to to skin the cat. Now, really, where you kind of got the different choice was sometimes you could do things in different orders. Okay. But obviously, like if it was something where you had to combine. It, not once again a little bit of a spoiler warning in Sam and Max. Um, the there's a there's a couple items you get one that's the the extendable you know I guess fire poker thingy, and then you get a Bigfoot hand and you attach them together so that you can go grab things. And um, <laughs> so obviously you have to do those in a particular order, and then anything you need to grab you have to have already done that. But you know there are pieces of the game that you can do out of order. So that's really kind of where you get your choice. Gotcha. But yeah, ultimately yeah. it's, it's so how is this different than uh portal portal? Not a point and click I'm assuming, but kind of it is right. No, no it's not. <laughs> it's, it's looking for you to do the one thing. I mean, it's a point and click in that you, you know, aim your first person character and you <laughs> click your mouse. Right. Yeah, um, so you're, you're pointing and then you're clicking. I mean, we're back to the idea of, you know, is what, what defines the adventure genre? Because in a lot of ways, um, Portal could be, you know, construed as, because while there is a little bit of, I guess, combat-ish stuff in Portal, um, you know, once again, it's, it's a, it's kind of a migration from point and click. I, I could see how Portal could be a, a first person adventure, right? Well, Portal right, yeah, 2 sure, especially sure. has that strong narrative through the whole thing. Oh, yeah. if, if it wasn't as so focused on the puzzles, right? right. If, they, if they went further with the story, I think I think Portal 2 could be an, could have been an adventure game in a different life. Gotcha. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. So, again, it's like just all I need to know is that I'm not stupid. That I'm not crazy. I can handle stupid. I could probably handle crazy. Yeah. I think there's a lot of, you know, I mean, I think I think that there is very little you know, strong genre walls anymore. Right. And so, um, you know, back in the day, like an RPG, as I talked about, you, you had a party of adventurers, like, you know, whether it's final fantasy or bard's tale, you had a party, everybody had stats, you know, you leveled up, you had, you know, you earned spells, you know, this was a, this was a, uh, you know, uh, it was a form and function genre. And now, you know, I see games that are like, you know, Prince of Persia, Sands of Time, titled as an RPG. I was like, that's odd. That's odd to me. That's you know? no. <laughs> Maybe <laughs> I'm going a little RPG extreme. In it? No, I don't think so. But um, you okay. know, I, I think I think that there's kind of this this idea as well that maybe now an RPG is hey, you're playing a character, right? I mean, maybe that's part of it too. Right. All right, well, this kind of ties into my pick then, and I'll, I'll give mine. So I was not sure about mine because of the genre and, and stuff that's in it that's not necessarily a classic adventure game. So, it's, But it's a Quest of Glory uh, series, right, which started with one of those type, your actions type of games and slowly morphed over the different entries, right, to, yeah. I guess, fundamentally be kind of an RPG, but it's Quest for, Quest for Glory 5, which... Mm. So I, I like I like this game quite a bit. I've only played a little bit of the first game uh, originally, and then I played the fifth one. And I, I completely stumbled across it by accident. I was I was at a Walmart, you know, buying socks as you do, and I skimmed by the PC section of the store because they used to sell PC software for cheap, and I saw a game there. And this is when I I was really early in my computing, uh, I guess, hobby. Like I I came late to computers. And I saw this game on sale, and it was super cheap, and it was Quest for Glory 5. So I picked it up, and it was a CD game. And I, I started playing it, and it's it's a fun adventure, and it's much like Sam Max. There's a lot of dialogue in this game. There's a whole island or a town of characters, and they're all quite unique. It's not just humans. It's, it's kind of like a Mediterranean-themed uh, fantasy world. And there's wizards, and then there's, you know... Uh, centurions and roman guards and stuff but then a lot of the townspeople are like talking dogs and cat people and stuff it's just really out there like one of the uh one of the characters is a is literally a tauros he's a bull bull mm. person right it's it's crazy but it's kind of like 
It carries the same story from the original first game in the 80s all the way up to the fifth game. In fact, you can actually, I didn't realize this, but as you played the series, Quest for Glory, over the last, what, 15 years, you could actually export your character and import it into those subsequent games, even though they're radically different. Like, the first game was total on, like Space Quest 1, type and walk around with the keyboard only, to the fifth game, which was point and click, and, you know, kind of had strong RPG elements to it, in a way. But it was neat because there were character classes and skills. There's a health bar. There was inventory. And that's where I wasn't sure if I can consider this one an adventure game. So I was walking, I'm watching through a playthrough of it again. There is quite a bit of combat in the game. The whole, the whole gist of the story is that you're a hero who's come to this island of Marit, and the king has been assassinated, and the the councils are holding a, a rights of rulership, and calling in heroes to come in and see who who's worthy to become king of this island. And you're trying to unravel the, the story of who killed the king, who's the assassin, and then trying to do these rights, these trials to become the ruler of the island. And it's, it's you get to put in skills and whatnot, but forget the combat because it sucks, like flat out. Like when I look at this game, but ultimately I decided that it's not an RPG because to me an RPG, the combat should be good. Right. <laughs> like it should be right. the fun part, right? And in Quest of Glory, the combat is very clicky and not in that fun Diablo way. It's more clicky and like you're just jamming that button so you don't run out of health before the bad guys do. Right. So forget all about the combat. The, folk, the, the main part is the dialogue, the wealth of dialogue, the, the people you talk to, the characters. There's humor there. Like, there's a lot of humor. When you mentioned Sam Max and Manic Mansion, uh, uh, Monkey Island, they're all known, I think, for their funny bits. And Quest of Glory is no different. There's, um, there's a lady at the inn, for example, uh, Gnome Anne. She's, she's the innkeeper. She's, she's a gnome. Wall-to-wall puns, right, from... <laughs> having a seat and have these gnome cooked meals, right? All the comforts of gnome. <laughs> Obviously it's right. It's like that kind of crap stuff. Or it's just like, she tells a story of like, well, here's your meal. It's garlic, smashed potatoes and pistachio cream. And then she goes into a story about how the cooks in the back were juggling the garlic, fell into your mashed potatoes and smashed them. The other cook was making ice cream, pistachio ice cream. And it kind of all got mixed together. Like she tells these funny stories about the food she serves you. And all the characters are kind of like that. They all have their gimmicks and there's humorous lines throughout the entire thing. And it's a, it's a really fun story. Like it's, it's great, but it's, it's more open than I expect from a point and click or an adventure game. Right. Sure. Like you'd mentioned a uh, Sinistar for what's the game. We just said, uh, you can do c- certain things in different orders with Sam Max. This yeah. game is similar. <clears throat> Sorry. Before you start the trials, you need to, basically collect a a thousand coins, a thousand drachma. So you can kind of do that in different ways. You can steal it as a thief. You can go and compete in the gambling games. You can do some minor, you know, fetch quests. There's all kinds of different ways of approaching this thing. You can go to arena battles and do the gladiatorial combat if you want. You can bet on on the battles. But all the way between that is these sequences where you're talking to a whole bunch of characters. There's minor puzzles, right? Things like there's a... um, it's like essentially a ski lift. So you have to like fix a lever, hop in the ski lift. You, you picked up rocks through your, your travels, throw the rock at the lever to activate it, to take you to another Island. Like that kind of puzzle, nothing, nothing taxing, but there's definitely puzzles there and just of uh, just a, a rich story. And it's, it's really quite good. So uh, quest for Glare five is the, is the one I, I like. And, have you have you guys you guys probably haven't played it? I don't know if Sinistar if you might have played this one or not. I played the first three, and okay. honestly, uh, you mentioned that the that the combat is um, is is not good, and um, that's kind of the thing that stood out as kind of why I stopped playing them. Okay. And now that said, um, you know, I think I think it also came from you know these were released by Sierra. Sierra was a point and click adventure game company, right? And here we now have this this you know janky RPG element thrown on top and the combat was bad. And so, um, but I do remember, um, you know, the first, the first one or two, I, I don't remember the story well enough, but I do remember I did like the story, you know? So, but yeah, I think I kind of gave up on them just primarily for the combat. I probably should pick those back up. It's it's because the, the engine, I guess they used for those games early on was never meant for combat. Right. Right. 
So I know the fifth one was a brand new uh, engine. Apparently they, they canceled the series after the, after the fourth game. And then this was early internet days. Hmm. So fans managed to get enough support, <laughs> I guess. Nice. And Sierra felt compelled to make another one. So they found the original one of the original creators of the of the series and gave them a ton of money. And they built it from the ground up. Apparently they wanted to make it a multiplayer game. <laughs> I guess they got squished hmm. through development. It's the early 3D graphics, okay. which is, is, I guess, why I like it so much. You know when you see the early PlayStation or PC games that had pre-rendered cutscenes, mm-hmm. but you try and qu- you question why they're pre-rendered because they're not that good. <laughs> yes. Yeah. yeah, like Diablo One cutscenes, they're good, but they're, they're not that good, right? Like it's really bad 3D models, and this game is right. full of that. But the actual game itself, uh, pre-rendered backgrounds all look great. The characters, although grainy. Are, are really diverse. You you see all the armor and weapons on your character. Uh, they, they show up on your, your character. Mm. And it's just uh, really impressive. And just because it was a CD game, they took full advantage with the music. Like full orchestral score. And it's it's really quite good for music in a game. Oh, sure. I uh, I mean, Sierra, back in the day, we talked about the MT32 Pi on the, on the Mr. Um, you know, the MT32 original device, um, Sierra actually became a reseller for it. Uh, in the States. Oh, really? Yeah. And so they, they actually hired, um, actual composers to come in and do the, the, the soundtracks for these games. And so, yeah, that, uh, Sierra kind of led that. Yeah. See, Sierra, you're right about their music. Um, uh, one of my favorite soundtracks of all time was Arcanum. It's, mm. it's an all string soundtrack. It's freaking amazing. It's a Sierra game. I'll have to go listen to that one. Yeah. Uh, Sinister, how about you give us your second pick? Uh, absolutely. So um, we touched on we touched on uh, Maniac Mansion and Day of the Tentacle, and um, that's important because uh, there's a there's a gentleman by the name of Tim Schafer who mm-hmm. has uh, a lot of fame in the adventure game world, uh, still active today. Um, he he did he was one of the primaries on Day of the Tentacle. He did he was one of the primaries on Monkey Island. Um, and then basically after Day of the Tentacle, they uh, Lucas Arts decided that he was you know good enough that they gave him you know free reign to do uh, his own game essentially, and this led to Full Throttle. And Full Throttle is uh, this this amazing tale uh, of of a biker gang, and it's one of these like Tim Schafer talks about. You know, when he pitched this, people were like, so are, are these going to be, you know, are they going to be, you know, out there beating people up and swilling, you know, alcohol and doing drugs, et cetera. And he said, no, these are going to be likable, likable, you yeah. know, biker gangs, um, which led to the main character, um, Ben, which by the way, once again, LucasArts, they, uh, tongue in cheek, um, they did the Star Wars, you know, uh, throwback. There's a, there's literally the line, Ben, you're my only hope, uh, in the game. Um, as well as a few other things like there, if you, if you pay close enough attention without giving too many spoilers, you'll see, uh, an empire tattoo, a, uh, rebel tattoo, uh, in the game, etc. But, um, this was, um, it took kind of that, that talkie to the next level that, that um, adventure game talkie, they hired a cast, including right. Mark Hamill and Maurice oh, LaMarche. Uh-huh. Mark Hamill. Oh, uh, yeah, Mark Hamill plays uh, the, the main antagonist. Oh, um, okay. Yeah. Um, and so, and Tress, uh, Tress McNeil is in it. Uh, you know, so a lot of these, these people that you know, in fact, uh, L- uh, Maurice LaMarche, the character that he voices, um, you know, sounds like the brain. I was going to say, because that's what he's, that's what, how I know him is, is the brain, but he's, uh-huh. he's freaking in everything. He's fantastic. Yeah. So he plays, and I can't remember the character's name, um, Nestor, his, the character's name, Nestor and Nestor sounds exactly like the brain. So <laughs> it, uh, it's, it takes kind of that, that level of, of that LucasArts humor, that adventure humor, um, you know, so much to the next level. Uh, and then this one definitely is 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 uh, has a higher quantity of puzzles. And when I say puzzles, you know, um, without giving too much away, at the beginning 
you you have to have your bike repaired. And so in order to right. repair your bike, you have to find, you know, particular parts. And in order to get these parts, you have to solve, you know, uh, a, a junkyard dog that attacks you. And how do you figure out how to get past the junkyard dog? Um, uh, you know, there's a, a part where you have to go find a, a welding torch. And, you know, I mean, so... To fight off a dog? You, you, you don't fight off the dog. It's an interesting puzzle. I'm not going to give it away. So okay. <laughs> Let's not get PETA involved. <laughs> no, no, no. You, uh, okay. So to not get PETA involved, you do, you trap the dog, okay. you know, temporarily you trap the dog. So to, to make sure that you can get into the, uh, the junkyard and get what you need. But, uh, one of the things I loved about this is, you know, we talked about the early days where it was, you know, typing, you would, you know, look, you know, look chair, get rock, etc. Um, Sam and Max moved to, uh, a choice system kind of at the bottom of the screen. Yes. You'd click around the screen to move, but then you'd have choices at the bottom of the screen. Okay. Full throttle took it and, and they gave you this interface that is, it's just entertaining. You click on something, it brings up, I, I don't know what to call it. It brings up a little, a little, you know, thing on your screen and you either move left to use your fist you move right to use your foot, you move okay. up into the skull to use your mouth, or you move up into the skull's eyes to look at the thing. And like um, a radial menu. Yeah, essentially. But you know, okay. done with done with like these graphics that are that are, that are very entertaining, and it leads to some great dialogue because you know at one point you're trying to find some gas, you find a, a gas tank, and you think you're supposed to siphon the gas in a particular way. You click on it, you select the mouth, and 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 Ben, the main character, responds, I'm not putting my lips on that. You know, <laughs> so there's, you know, the, the comedy's great. The, um, there's a, 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 early in the game, there's a, you know, a part where this bartender is being difficult. And your character being this hard-ass, you know, biker says, you know, it'd look better on, on, uh, on your nose. And the guy says, what? And he, you grab the guy's nose ring and slam him down on the bar. And you say, oh. uh, you know, the bar, right? So, um, <laughs> is this anyway. animated? This is, animated, it is, right? it is. I've and so some of this, yeah. And in fact, if you watch, if you watch kind of the, the making of, they were really pushing the extremes of what the, the computer hardware could do in, in the day. And so right. a lot of the animation scenes, you'll notice they, um, only animate portions of the scene. You know, this is before like full motion video, etc. Right. And so they, you know, to push that, they they did a lot of inference too. Like you walk into a room and it shows like you look around the corner and then the other person look around the corner, but they don't show the room, right? So it, you get that concept of, hey, we're looking at each other, but you know, that way they could make sure that the animation, you know, kept up with what the hardware could do. Yeah, from so. what I've seen of it, it does seem like it really pushes the envelope of Oh yeah of using sprites, but making it look as animated as possible. Right. There's Absolutely. A, like a car chase scene and, and the guy has his head of the, the car. <laughs> and like you can tell it's the static car, but the background I think is scrolling and the guy's right. mouth is moving pretty animatedly. It's, it's done amazingly well. Like it's, it is like a cartoon. Just Absolutely. Like a budget one, but it's uh, I didn't realize Hamill was in it and LaMarche was in it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, in fact, Hamill and, and LaMarche are on the same team as it were in Ooh. that game. So, uh, they're both part of the, the antagonist crew. Okay. But, uh, no, it's a great game. Um, and then, you know, kind of one of those, you know, they had their, their way they could do, you know, kind of push the extremes. If you make it to the end credits, it's well worth watching. Um, there's a haiku section in the credits where it's biker haiku, you know? Um, <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then, and then a, um, kind of a tie to we talked about tim schaefer kind of a tie here he actually wanted to have a scene where the main character you know got some mushrooms or something and had a psychedelic experience and you had to play through it well they dropped that for budget reasons <laughs> and tim schaefer kept rolling that around in his head over and over and over again and that eventually became the game psychonauts so See, uh, no, that's when you said Tim Schafer, that's how I, I know him as Psychonauts. Uh, Although again, I, my secret shame, I have not played it, uh, but I've seen a lot of footage from, uh, from the game. GP, have you, have you heard of any of Tim Schafer stuff? 
I probably have, but honestly, I don't know. I I feel so bad for being so out of the loop on this one. Well, it's it's fine. Like I haven't played Full Throttle either. I've only just seen people stream it on uh, on Twitch. Right. So I mean, I I likely have just not knowing it was Tim Schafer. Yeah. You know I mean. So he he now is. Uh, you've probably seen Double Fine Productions. Yeah. Um, that's his. That's his company. Um, Psychonauts, Psychonauts 2 is coming out. He also did Costume Quest. Uh, and then, of course, as we mentioned, Monkey Island, Day of the Tentacle. Uh, one that we didn't mention, Grim Fandango, which he did after Full Throttle. In fact, they asked him if he wanted to do Full Throttle 2, but he had this idea that he wanted to do uh, a story about the transition through, you know, kind of the, the when you die to the point that you make it to wherever your end goal is, so that... And that became kind of the Day of the Dead, you know, the Grim Fandango story. Uh, another fantastic game. Plenty of humor. I know it sounds like it would be serious, but plenty of humor. Um, you know, like one of the humor pieces is the bureaucracy that is, you know, the system, right? And so right. you as this main character have to figure out how to make it through the bureaucracy to get where you need to go. Yeah, when I was looking at my game, the uh, Quest for Glory 5 released the same year as Grim Fandango. Mm. So when it came to the end of the year game awards for, for these things, a lot were given it to Grim Fandango. Sure, <laughs> sure. That's one I always wish I went back to play. So I, I'm just going off this stuff. Are you guys familiar with the band The Talking Heads? Oh, yeah. Would you I say that so. these kind of games are like the thinking man's games, like The Talking Heads were thinking man's rock? Like, it just sounds to me like everybody in the room developing these games was just listening to Psycho Killer and thinking, how do we, how do we turn this kind of feeling into a video game? Because, like, that's... Huh. You, you, yeah, I, that's just kind of my takeaway from this, coming in relatively fresh as somebody who's only played 20 minutes of these games ever. Sure. And, I, I mean, I love the talking heads, but I, I just... It's a different kind of thinking, and it sounds like it's a different way of... Approaching games, you know, you talk about Grim Fandango, uh, which, you know, over the past week, that's a title I saw repeatedly come up, but I never clicked on it because it wasn't part of what I misunderstood the assignment to be. But it just, it seems so heady, you know what I mean? So cerebral, but still fun. And I don't sure. know, I'm I'm intrigued. Well, so did, does that track the, the Talking Heads thing? To throw a wrench in your gears here. I mean, we haven't brought up a series that's very, very important in the in the adventure game genre that that is probably going to throw a wrench in your thought here, which is Leisure okay. Suit Larry. Oh, okay. Because <laughs> you know that's that's about a guy that his whole goal is to get laid. Yeah, like that's that's the whole goal. So this is written. That one was written by teenagers, obviously. Obviously. Uh, right. <laughs> but the thing with Leisure Suit Larry, Leisure Suit Larry, there is yeah, juvenile, yeah, but. There's a lot of thought into the plot of of these games, right? Oh, sure. In the same decade, when people are making like Mario, which I love Mario, but that that's a game that's all about the mechanics. Whereas the adventure games, like Larry and Space Quest and, and Grim Fandango, was all about the story, right? So when you're looking at music, you have your pop songs with the same one line every over and over again, and then you have some songs where they actually tell a story, and the lyrics are vastly different to the entire four minute track, right? Right, sure. Sure. It's the, um, well, Leisure Suit Larry, forgive me that I'm so simile and metaphor centric the past month. Leisure Suit Larry is to adventure games as Earthworm Jim is to platformers. That's a fair assessment. All right, cool. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Okay. Not that any of that matters. I'm just digesting. You've distilled it down. You've distilled it down. So you've got to have, you've got to have your Earthworm Jims. Right. Mm -hmm. You've got to have those. But really, yeah, I think you're right. I think, you know, if it were, you know, comparison to the, the 80s rock bands. Yeah, you'd probably see, you know, Talking Heads or, or Violent Femmes or something being the, right. you know, the adventure genre, um, you know, group. Maybe that's why I liked them so much. I love Talking Heads. I love yeah. I love Violent Femmes. Right. Right. Well, it, and it's one of those things where on the on the glossy surface is successful, but there's all these layers and once you start to think of how it was really composed and put together, it's like kind of staggering. Uh, and it seems like that because all these things that I've seen and researched and, and the little bit that I've played are like, man, that looks awesome. But there's, you know, it's it's the it's the iceberg, the tip of the iceberg. There's a whole lot under the under the surface. But again, these are just thoughts from a casual observer who's who's playing the part of the audience. 
So thank you. Now you brought up, uh, you know, you brought up music, which I was going to bring up as part of Full Throttle. The soundtrack for Full Throttle is amazing. Um, they actually, and I don't know this band other than Full Throttle, but uh, a San Francisco band by the name of the Gone Jackals. <laughs> no, nope. don't think I've heard of them. I don't know them. Yeah, it, the soundtrack is. I mean, it very much tracks with that biker, you know, uh, genre uh, soundtrack. So, um, did did any of you play the? Uh, um, uh, what were those? What were those bike games where you 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 know beat up the other bikers? Um, oh, uh, Road Rash. Yeah, did you yes. ever play Road Rash? In fact, funny enough, um, they wanted to bring in Soundgarden to do the soundtrack for Full Throttle. Oh, that'd have been great. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. Interesting. It's it's great that they want to bring an actual band and yeah. not just do the music in house, which is really interesting to me. Right. Yeah. So, and uh, I guess I guess uh, Soundgarden decided to go do Road Rash instead. So. But cool. um, no, well, well, well done the soundtrack for uh, Full Throttle, for sure. Yeah, I think of all the adventure games, I think that's the one I want to play the most because I've seen a few people play it recently, and I didn't want I, the thing with these games. Is I don't want to watch too much of them on YouTube or on Twitch because I don't want to spoil the story because I feel like I'm only going to play it once. Right. But these things are never short. <laughs> that's the <laughs> other problem I have. Right. Sure. Now, Full Throttle is one of the shorter um, in the genre. Uh, in fact, that's kind of one of the running jokes is, uh, I think Tim Schafer was quoted in a, in an interview saying one day that, you know, if he walks into a bar and all these, you know, bikers get angry at him because he made such a short biker gang or game, but it is well worth it. And by the way, to, to, uh, go to playing it now, there is a remastered version that, um, I haven't played, but I've heard it was, it was well received and well done. Oh, you know, I'll have to check that out because I, I know there's a it's, there's a remaster of Monkey Island that people like, but there's a couple of choices they made with the dialogue that people didn't care for. So I'm gonna have to look up this one. I think it's great that Tim Schafer is, like you said, still around today making games. Uh, Double Fine actually got bought out by Microsoft, so he's at Microsoft now making games. Oh wow! And it's great because I always felt like, especially recently, his ideas for games were not mainstream enough to probably get the funding. I know he had to go to Kickstarter for for one or two of them. So now he's at Microsoft and they're like, here's your money. <laughs> Go make them, right? Very Do whatever nice. you want. Like he's like Kojima in the idea of like, he's just one of those creative people in games. You just give him the budget and you let him, you just let him, let him do what he wants to do and let him make something that's great. Yeah. Yeah. He's one of those names in, in the, you know, in the gaming world that, you know, anytime I kind of really hear his name, I think it's going to be something good. Uh, you yeah. know, another name that comes up for me there, you know, not to go too far off here, but but Ken Levine or Ken Levine, I don't know how you pronounce it. Um, uh, Levine, yeah, from Bioshock. Yeah. Right? Uh huh. Yeah. Um, yeah. System Shock, etc. Yeah, another one of those. Like every once in a while, you see these guys that just make amazing games. Yeah, I know. It's it's neat how there's just such a there's personality behind these games. I think as King's Quest had. Was it Roberta? Roberta? And I can't remember her husband's name. But Ken. Uh, Roberta and Ken Williams. Ken. Yeah. Yeah. So they, I mean, they they were like one of the stars of Sierra back in the day. Mm-hmm. So husband and wife team making a bunch of the of these games. And um, I'll, yeah. I don't, we're running out of time, so I don't, want, I don't want to spend too much on it. But the other game I had was Manhunter series, Manhunter 2. Oh, yeah. Not the PS1 gore fest, but it's a Sierra game. And uh, it was made by a family. Husband, wife, and a son team did both of these games. And it's unlike the other adventure games, there's not a focus on the humor, although it certainly has funny parts to it. But it's a uh, post apocalyptic world where alien orbs, giant eyeballs, have taken over and they've enslaved the human race. And some humans called manhunters wear brown bathrobes and they have to round up all the humans for the, the orbs. But it's like, it's an adventure game. They're, like, there's they're, the puzzles of finding items, like going back to the dog <laughs> situation. That's why I thought it was funny. Uh, you pick up a muzzle from a pawn shop later on in the game. When you enter somebody's apartment, a dog leaps out of the fireplace and you have to muzzle it. So it's, it's a little bit of the quick time to it, mm-hmm. but it's mostly having the right item at the right time. But I, I like that one so much because of the, there's not much talking that the protagonist doesn't speak, but the characters in the backgrounds are so great even for a game that came out in, I think it was 89, so it's an old one. But the, with the limited color palette and resolutions, they did such an amazing job just destro- showing this dest- destroyed San Francisco, like a just utterly apocalyptic San Francisco. 
Uh, I think it's fantastic. Nice. But, I mean, it has it has some action bits to it. Like there's a section where you're in a sewer and there's rats and bats coming down a hallway and you have to either punch or kick the rats and bats. Gross, but that's kind of the game. <laughs> or like uh, there's one where there's a fountain and you have to spin on the fountain to get it to get out of it. So there's little, little tiny action-y bits, mm-hmm. but with really cool set pieces and designs uh, backgrounds and it's really great. So like... It's just fantastic, but also again, made a family family affair, right? Like these guys, they only ever did Manhunter one and two. It kind of ended on a cliffhanger. They never got a third one, unfortunately. But when I look at like uh, Ked Roberta Williams uh, went to Kickstarter, I think recently, or they got funding to make a new game that's coming out, I think this or next year. I always yeah. hope that these guys, the Murray family, would get the funding to make another Manhunter. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know that Kickstarter has you know made a lot of. Um... Like you brought up Quest for Glory. I actually backed um, the the developers of Quest for Glory. I backed their Kickstarter a few years ago. Um, they had one? Yeah, it's called, I think, Hero U, like Hero University. Oh, I've heard I've heard of the game. I didn't realize that was them. Yeah, I think that's I think that's what it is. Hang on, let me let me before I put my foot in my mouth here. Okay, we do that a lot here, Presby. Yeah, I okay, fair enough. Um yeah, Lori and Ann Cole. Or Laurie Ann Cole and Corey Cole, okay. the creators of Quest for Glory. So yeah, Hero U. So I backed that one. That's um, awesome. I wonder how that one turned out. Uh, I own it. I've. I have to. You know, my backlog of games just keeps getting longer and longer. <laughs> you know. Um, Trust me, we know. <laughs> <laughs> it's that stupid adult thing. You know. Yeah. Well, that's the thing. Like, it's it's what week every week. There's a street and a Steam sale, and it's like, what game am I going to buy that I'm not going to play 20 right. years from now? I'm terrible with that too. Or even worse, humble bundles, right? Yeah. I actually went through recently and claimed a bunch of my codes just to get them in my Steam library. <laughs> Very nice. Very nice. All right. Uh, I guess we're going to wrap up. Anything else you guys want to mention? I mean, we could talk for a long time, right? Because we, you know, there are a lot of other, you know, groups that did these games. Um, I don't know. Maybe someday we'll we'll have a another talk about it because like access did a whole series etc but uh yeah yeah i i would very much like to do a follow-up in a couple of months after i've had some time because some of the batman games the newer batman games are on my list of games i want to play because i haven't played them uh right. but also now I, I do have the desire to try out not just maniac mansion and the the nes ones that i have um here in the in the office but some of the some of the ones that i've just never even heard of today so I say this from time to time. I always mean it, but my interest has peaked. And this is probably a genre unlike any other in my books because it's one that I am so far removed from. So I, I think a follow-up sure. uh, w- would be in order so I can properly contribute. But yeah, this uh, this is great. And well, you know, we always love having you on Sinistar. I appreciate that. While you're checking out Telltale Games, play Wolf mm-hmm. Among Us. I think you would like that one, yes. GP. Okay. It's it's brutal. Yeah. It's gritty. Oh yeah, you had me at uh, GP. You know my name, so whatever you want, absolutely. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> yeah, Wolf Among Us. I heard was really fantastic. Um, the one I wanted to try was Grim Fandango. That's the one that's like high on my list of games to go through. But uh, like also, the, the, also uh, remastered. Also remastered and released. Is it really? Yeah, a lot of these have been remastered now. Then that's I, crazy. I think Tim Schafer kind of went back and looked at his games in particular. And once the you know the the rights were able to transfer back to him, I think he I think he as part of Double Fine did it. Right. Interesting. Actually, before we go, because all this talk about like doing things in in like a certain puzzles and environments and stuff, Resident Evil, would that count as an adventure game? Look, I tried to make the point that Portal is a point and click <laughs> adventure, so yeah, that's fine. <laughs> And if that's the discussion, we got a whole other hour to discuss because <laughs> I love Resident Evil. It's a great okay. series. I've only ever played the first one, honestly. The original PS1, PlayStation, uh, uh, Resident Evil. And I okay. just, uh, in my mind, every time I, I think about Resident Evil, I picture that rat thing coming out of the ceiling at you. Love it. Yeah. I think if you take out some of the zombies, I think I think it might qualify. Yeah. Sure. Anyway. All right. Uh, all right. Uh, Sinistar, how about you tell folks where they can find you and what you've been doing? Uh, I'm on Twitch, Sinistar77. 
Um, I, I like to, to hang out and, um, participate in a lot of, uh, Twitch streams as well. Uh, hang out with GP, uh, sick Jake, when you're, uh, when you're streaming, I try to hang out. Um, but yeah. Uh, and you can find me on, on, uh, Twitter as well. Sinister 77 also. Great. Awesome. And GP, how about you? Well, I just returned to streaming on Twitch at, uh, twitch.tv slash the retro therapy. Um, Otherwise, all the major social media platforms, Instagram, Twitter, all that, YouTube, you can find me. Just search The Retro Therapy. I haven't had the ability to make this joke. Is there an underscore at the end of that? Oh, no. <laughs> that, no, that's a retro joke. <laughs> that is, yes, that is a 19-year-old joke now. Exactly. <laughs> uh, and I'm Sick Jake. You can find me on Twitch and Twitter. Uh, actually, my wife and kids are going away for a week and a half, so guess what I'll be doing for a solid week? Porn. I'll be streaming. Oh, yes, streaming. Well, and, and Orange YouTube, yeah, of course, okay, yeah. but I'm going to be streaming. Uh, I've been doing mostly BizHawk Shuffler. I, I get a real kick out of getting stuff from the chat and just having the Shuffler throw them at me 15, 30 seconds at a time. So, nice. Uh, Love it. By the time this episode's air, you'll see that in VODs, probably. <laughs> Fantastic. All right. Sinistar, thanks very much for coming on. Uh, you've always been one of the greatest supporters of the podcast, and, and I know GP and Wolf and me as well, so we definitely greatly appreciate it. It was great yes. to have you on uh, today to talk about some adventure games. This thanks awesome. for having me. I appreciate being here. All right. All right, everybody. That's been another week of Press Me to Cancel. See you next week. Uh, also, go ahead and point and click on that subscribe button. See what I did there? Well done. Special thanks to Arthur the Ancient on SoundCloud for our podcast theme. Listen to more episodes on our website, pressbeatacancel.com. As well, feel free to like or subscribe at Apple and Google Podcasts, Pocket Casts, or anywhere else you like to listen to your favorite shows. Thank you to our supporters on patreon.com slash pressbeatacancel. Your money helps keep this ball rolling. And as always, thank you to all our listeners. This has been... Cancel. Thank you.